Well, right on the heels of the 81st Academy Awards ceremony, I'm delighted to be enjoying some post-Oscar buzz with a former Hollywood actor. Ed Clements oversees the pastoral care, seniors, and singles departments at Queensway Cathedral in Toronto. He's also involved in the church's production team. So Ed, welcome. Thank you. Writing, directing, yep. and acting. Sometimes, yeah. Still yeah. a very important part of your life. Yeah. But you were there. Yeah. 91, mm -hmm. and in a very meaningful way because the movie that you acted in yeah. was a nominee for Best Original Screenplay. Metropolitan, tell us about it. It was a small film that was done in um, New York when I was there in theater school. And uh, the, it was a small, low-budget, non-union film that was really just something that uh, took off. It was a year after we finished filming when all of us had gone our separate ways and gone on to other things. Suddenly we started getting these calls, one from the director gathering the whole cast back together to say, you know, your life is gonna change. This movie started going to the Cannes Film Festival, the New York Film Festival, Venice, the Toronto Film Festival, they flew me home for that. And then all of a sudden it got nominated for an Oscar. So little did I know how my life was going to change, but it certainly did. There's usually at least one of those that, that bubbles up to the surface yeah. at Oscar time. Something obscure, something that could easily have been lost in the shuffle that yeah. shines. Yeah, and it's a real privilege when you don't know what you're getting into when you're doing it. And suddenly it's like God just took over and had that for a moment. We're going to have a moment, aren't okay. we? Yeah. Of seeing you. Tell us about the part. Uh, I was the part of Tom Townsend. Now, I originally had read for another part, which I didn't get, and it was this guy, Charlie Black, who read the Bible all the time. And I thought, not being a Christian at the time, it still fascinated me. But I ended up being Tom Townsend, and this was a character who was sort of the guy from the other side of the tracks. He was from the west side of Manhattan, and the rest of the uh, cast were debutantes from the east side of Manhattan. Mm. And so I really didn't fit in, and I was this loner, and they basically brought me into their group, and I discovered a little bit more about it. So, so Ed as Tom. Right. Let's take a look at a little slice from Metropolitan. That's priceless. And then she told me to they look awfully big for mice. She believed it? Oh, completely. Oh, that's priceless. <laughs> you mentioned something about it in one of your letters. When I was going through some stuff over Christmas, I found a packet of your old letters. You save my letters? Of course. I save all the personal letters I get. Don't you? No. You mean you threw away all the letters I wrote you? I threw away nearly everything. I don't want to go through the rest of my life with the mail I got when I was 16. I'm really surprised. If someone goes through the trouble of writing you a real letter, I save it. People don't write many personal letters anymore. People in boarding school do. And what if someone who wrote you becomes famous? Those letters could be the only record of what they were thinking at that time. Crucial for their biographers. Anybody who writes me who expects to become famous should keep carbons. Well, it just seems to me that it's a kind of trust. If someone takes the trouble to write you a substantial letter, you not throw it out. I didn't save your letters, but I didn't throw them out. I don't understand. Is that a riddle? There was a girl at school who had some kind of a crush on you. She came into my room when I was throwing things out, so I gave her your letters. Really? I know it sounds queer. She kept them? Mm, I'm sure. How oh, strange. She must be really odd. No, she's very nice. In fact, you know her. Audrey Rouget. Mississauga born, pretty significant to be coming home from New York for the Toronto Film Festival. Yeah. That for was your a, film. It was pretty, pretty special. You know, my folks came to see it and a lot of local family and friends and things. And uh, that, was, that was pretty, that was probably one of the most, more exciting times. I'd gotten to the, Ven uh, the Cannes Film Festival and the Oscars and other things. And that had its own significance. But coming home was, had its own way. Neato. Yeah. The Oscars, what's your takeaway from that glittering evening? 91. 91, yeah. You know, going there, it's a, it's a pretty spectacular event. It's very big, as you can imagine. What you see on TV, it's mm -hmm. just as big. And you meet a lot of famous people, but I think the thing that really caught me off guard, because I'd grown up liking movies and television and Hollywood, and my dad was a cameraman at the CBC, so I knew a little bit about the industry. But what was fascinating was that um, the people that you meet, the famous people, 
they get up in the morning just like you and I get up. They, you know, get ready, they have their coffee, they drive to work or whatever, wherever they're going. And they're just like you or I, mm -hmm. just they're more recognizable. And that put things in perspective. I was so um, stirred by the difference this year. Um, and, and obviously the actors present were. I, I'd never seen an Oscar evening where right. everybody's eyes are full for so much of the, of the time. And I thought uh, one of the things we learn to teach our children is that they are not, much as they may feel it, the center of the universe. There That's is right. God and there is family history. There was a whole world before they showed up. That's right. And something about that uh, umbrella of, of actors through the years was, was deeply meaningful. I, I think it, it took some of these tabloid types to something deeper and richer, the history. Yeah of the profession. And then of course the words of affirmation, they, they must all have read the blessing before yeah. they planned that evening because everybody took home something. And you know, when an economy, in an economy this way in times that are difficult and changing seasons, I think it's good for us to remember what's important. And even in Hollywood, those people are real people that have to, when the lights are all off, when the curtain closes, when the stage is dark, they go home and they have to face themselves. They have to face what their beliefs in God are. Now, what were you in this for? Ed, well, why did you pursue acting? Well, you know, it's funny. I enjoy doing small school productions and things like that. How I got into it professionally, I'd done community theater and things, was very unusual. My mom had just passed away. And uh, my dad uh, had a workmate who came to the funeral. And I was giving the eulogy at my mom's funeral. And I got a call the same day as the funeral from this casting director saying, do you want to be in this TV show? Now that doesn't happen to actors. You don't get a call from a casting director, especially not on the day of your mother's funeral, saying, do you want to be in this TV show? And I said, yeah, because I enjoyed acting, but I never considered it as a career. I got some more jobs after that, and I thought, you know, if I want to do this seriously, I better go to school and learn and get trained. So that's when I started auditioning for different theater schools, went to New York, studied there, did Metropolitan, and then ended up in California. Now you mentioned your mom's passing. Mm -hmm. It was a brain tumor. Yeah. And was it not just on the heels of your brother's death? Yeah. Your only sibling. That's right. My brother has, was, was killed in a car accident in 83, and then a year and a half later, my mom went in the hospital with a brain tumor, and about eight months later, she passed away. Not I, easy. I, w did this become something hopeful in your life, something mm. encouraging in a hard place? Not, not, not in the sense of God. I mean, God, I think, was behind the scenes working out. I wasn't even aware of it. But my mom had been searching spiritually, because I think everyone has a spiritual hunger, and we're going to fill that some way or another. And unless it's in, in God, we're going to find something else to fill it. My mother started reading the Shirley MacLaine books and started exploring into the New Age and stuff. And I saw her get... Out on a limb. And she was out on a limb, yeah. So yeah. Someone my... Someone wrote a, a response to that, out on a broken limb. Yeah. Well, yeah. and you know what? The, the neat thing is my mom got saved just before she died. So I was thankful for that. But I was still searching and I wasn't at that place yet. So I started going down the same route, found some answers in that. And then suddenly it was like all the legs of that fell out from under me. And I was left legless, really, standing there wondering, what am I supposed to believe? And a friend of mine who I was going to theater school with, had she and her husband invited me to their church and I went for a few times and felt this sense of acceptance and a, a sense like, gee, I think I could belong here. Because it was like a family and not having much of a family of my own, I was, uh, Dis, uh, disconnected from my dad and had gone off in search of my own um, path. So when I went to this church in, in Brooklyn for a little while, I started getting seeds of something that I thought was interesting. And then when I moved to California, they said, you know what, you should still pursue going to church when you're out there. And sure enough, I did. And Jack Hayford's church. Jack Hayford's church. Majesty. And that's right. I always think of that. That's a good song. Yeah. And <laughs> he's, he's a wonderful pastor. And that's where I really accepted Christ. I was sitting in the service that Sunday morning. And I'd been there for a few weeks and made some friends. And funnily enough, that Sunday morning, there was nobody there that I knew. My friends weren't there. And what happened was, I was sitting in the service, and he was talking, and I started getting very agitated and feeling uneasy and wanting to get up and leave. So much so that I'd given the envelope of my offering to the person beside me saying, can you take this and, and put it in the plate? I'm leaving. And he said, yeah, sure. But then I proceeded to sit there. I physically could not get up and leave. It was like I was glued to the spot. I mean, I know I had a will to leave, but I just could not bring myself to get up and leave. And at the end of the service, Jack Hayford made a call and said, you know, if anybody wants to rededicate their life to the Lord this morning, just come forward. And all of a sudden, this lightness came over me, and I stood up hmm. and walked forward and, and uh, accepted the Lord. I got baptized that same night, 
in their evening service. And then everything broke loose in my life career-wise. Everything started, God was reshuffling and mm. saying, okay, here's some new priorities. And that's when things started changing for me and uh, moving forward. You've, uh, you've glossed over it, but you really did get into the occult, uh, the new age. Yeah.